I'm playing now a horn called the Virtuoso. It's by a company named R.S. Berkeley. Uh, some of the horns are out now. This one will be out in another, I think, three months. So it's called R.S. Berkeley. You can go to rsberkeley.com, check it out. Uh, I play on the Yamaha. It's a New York model, Zeno artist series. Um, that line just came out a couple of years ago. I really like it because it takes some of what has worked in the past and combined it with some new technologies uh, for in, uh, consistent intonation. So I really like that instrument a lot. Yes, sir. On the windows is how you get a nice vibrato. Uh, it's a combination of two things. One from the armature and the other from the air. A combination, for me, I do a combination of both. Uh, some people just <laughs> with the air. To me, that's harder to control. And um, if you do it with your mouth, while still keeping the, the circular, the good tight circular uh, aperture, you know, aperture or whatever, or armature on your horn. But if you do a combination of the two, then you can have a more vibrant vibrato. Not, maybe not always as fast, but in jazz you don't need a fast vibrato like you would in certain styles of classical saxophone. And you can do ooh, 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 For trumpet, it's a little different. Uh, for me, I try to keep this muscle that's around your lips as still as possible. This muscle is called the orbicularis oris, which is a circular muscle, donut shape, that keeps the lips in place. Uh, for me, <clears throat> I try to do it with the oral cavity, focusing on the back end of the oral cavity and the raising of the tongue, which is also how I uh, deal with range. Uh, a good way to work on that is by doing, uh, people call them lip slurs, but I call them tongue slurs. Because your tongue is actually doing it. So if you're whistling. As you can see, if you can't see me, my lips aren't moving, but the air is being altered, or the pressure of it is being altered slightly. So it's your tongue doing it. Yeah, man. <laughs> yes. Yes to both. Yeah. <laughs> both. <laughs> you don't want it to be metronomic. It's just so rigid that feels like a machine. It's because some people focus on the time so much that there's no interplay. I think there needs to be a certain amount of elasticity, but at the same time you've got to be conscious of a groove. And groove is elastic, it's not metronomic. We're human beings. So I think both need to come to I mean our heartbeat, it, it goes fast and slow. It varies a little bit. You know, we try to our heart, you know, stays in a constant rhythm, but it's not exactly this. So our music is going to be like that. A groove consists of many different tempos in a sense. The bass may be playing more behind the beat or in some cases may be playing on top of the beat while the drum plays more behind the beat in order to get that kind of groove. Then you get a little low to it. So it's, it's not going to be, you know, like you said, just astronomically boom, 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 boom. And but that's you know, interesting. If you, if you take of two measures of four four, and there's a and then there's quarter notes there, right? And your quarter note is represented by a circle. So you have circle, 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 and they're all evenly placed together in a time. I think that what makes things swing or groove is a concept of that placement or that attack between the uh, the rise symbol and the drums and the bass and the consistency of that within each quarter note in each measure. So if, the, if the, uh, the drummer is playing on the back end of the attack of that quarter note and the bass player is playing on the front end of the attack of that quarter note and it's consistent from beat to beat, it's going to swing. That's right. 
Now, if it's not consistent, then you're out of time with yourself, first and foremost. And if you're out of time with yourself, you can't be in time with somebody else. So that's when things start to waver. Or if people both play on top of the beat, then what happens is that attack moves the beat forward. Does that make sense? So if, if the center of the beat is here, and the attack is always on the front, then it's going to speed up because the attack is going to start to feel like the center of the beat. So you have to discuss, uh, if there's a bass player and a drummer, you have to talk to each other about where you're going to place that thing or listen to each other and vibe that way so that there's a chemistry and a consistency from beat to beat. And you can see that if you just go to your records that you already have at home. If you go and listen to uh, some of the Cannibal Avenue records with Lewis Hayes and Sam Jones, you know that Sam Jones plays on top of the beat while Lewis Hayes plays right on it. And they sound so great together. Then you go back and listen to Jimmy Cobb and Paul Chambers play together, another classic duo, where Paul Chambers would stay at home and Jimmy would play more on top of the beat. And it always sounds good and always swinging. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to take. If you would take, I mean, if always studying miles and rhythm sections is a great way to study how to play time. <clears throat> Especially when you have a consistent Paul Chambers that plays, that's just his embodiment of the big, of that type of playing is consistent. And you switch the drummers, and you see how much, just by changing the, drum, the drummer from Philly Joe Jones to, Paul, uh, to uh, Jimmy Cobb, you see how much the beat changes. But it's still killing. They're both swinging. It's just that the, the approach changed. And that's, that's really interesting if you study those records. Okay, one and two. <laughs> Okay, uh, when uh, I was taking lessons and learning a lot from a trumpet player named Danny Harper, uh, if you may remember, his brothers are the Harper brothers, uh, Philip Harper and Bernard Harper, a great, they were a great band that came out in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Danny is their older brother, and he taught me so much about music. He was a student of Bill Fielder, and and a uh, student of Barry Harris. But uh, what, what we used to talk about all the time was how to really study a tune and how to take any tune and play it as a ballad so you can really understand how one chord would go to another chord by slowing it down, like studying giant steps. I studied to play it as a ballad in order to understand, okay, how does this chord, this B major seven chord, relate to this D chord, this D seven, to go to G major? to go to B flat, how those things really tie together. I can always play a, a, a pattern to go over the stuff, but to really understand the nicks and crannies and how to really tie those things together, you slow it down so you can understand it. So when I started doing that, I said, well, there's a lot of tunes I like to do like that. So four would be one, uh, wave, I would do wave as a ballad. It's a beautiful song, all these beautiful songs with beautiful melodies that we use to play on tempo. I said, let me just take them down and just see what it sounds like. And just. Something happened, I had a gig actually. I, the first time I ever did it, uh, we was playing in a gig and I just felt like doing something different. That's what, that's what I came kind of about. Did we ever work on field? question is, uh, did, you, did we ever work on feel? And uh, yes, <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, it's funny when people are transcribing solos on records or learning solos on records, most people just learn the notes. That's only like one fifth of it. Okay, it's how those notes are interpreted, <clears throat> the space between the notes, the articulation, all of that contributes to what a solo is. So, um, even today, I'm thinking about different ways to play the time, and I'm always conscious of how I feel the time. And I, I even choose members in my, my personal band based on what my feeling of time is. Okay, it, it's always there, always first and foremost in my, uh, in my mind. So when you're, 
when you're working on trans uh, transcribing solos and learning solos, be, be very aware of that. And when you're playing with other people, try to figure out what their concept of the time is. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a really good question. And uh, what Sean said is true. When you're studying the solo, uh, when you're studying the way a person plays, even if you're not like playing the solo verbatim, but how they, what their vibe was. If you study somebody like Dizzy Gillespie, was he playing real hard swing? Was he playing more straight? Did he use a lot of triplets? Did he do this and that and the other? You know, did you ask those questions and you figure those things out? Then you go and look at a Kenny Durham. And okay, did he swing hard like that? Did he swing hard like like uh, Nat Adderley? Or did he play more straight? Well, how did he articulate those things? Well, how did he, you know, how did he do this? How did he do that? And then you start to figure out, okay, this is his style, this is his feel. Okay, he plays on top of the beat. He plays behind the beat. Uh, Dexter DeGordon may play flat, while uh, Jack McLean will play real sharp, you know? That's the sound, that's the vibe. Those, those are the things outside of the notes, and those are the, the you know, uh, kind of contribute to those fields that you're talking about. Yeah, you have to study all of that. Yeah, but before you can really sound like yourself, you gotta sort of sound like somebody else. You gotta have a reference point, that's right. Um, you, <laughs> it's, it's always interesting. I find that even with certain students that I have, they, they say, well, you know, improvisation isn't as spontaneous. And I say, well, <laughs> what are you going to talk about if you have nothing to talk about? So, and that include that's not just notes, that's, that's feel, tip, all of that. And I guess in, there was a book I was reading about Miles, and um, People were trying to figure out how he got his sound. Somebody asked Miles how he got his sound. And he said he put all his favorite players in a funnel, and whatever ran out at the bottom is what he came up with. <laughs> yes, sir. Say that again. How often did I practice when I was in school? As much as I possibly could. Really. Um, some days, depending on what I had to do at home, it was three, four hours, some days, it was eight, nine hours. Um, I remember waking up every morning, it's six o'clock in the morning, and, and practicing then, going in the basement, in the laundry room, where nobody could hear me, turning on a flashlight so that it, I could see a little bit, and doing long tones. Um, yeah, it's funny, people always ask me that, how much did you practice? How many, as much as it takes. And you have to have a plan when you practice. It's not enough just to practice. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So just as much as you play, you have to think about it. Former professor Bill Fielder, he said, there's two things in life that are free to breathe and to think, and people don't want to do either one of them. That's right. That's right. Oh, um, yeah, right here. Oh, okay. Practicing. Uh, there's two things I would always practice. Long tones I would do every day. Because I knew if I didn't have a sound, I mean, it didn't matter what notes I played. Nobody would want to hear it. So that's what I would do, and, and, and my feeling, is what I had learned is that practicing quiet, to really be able to listen and hear myself and hear every particular part of the note would give me more control over the note so I could play at any volume and still have that kind of control. You know, the hardest thing to do is when you're playing is really listening to yourself. Because you have one sound inside your head, you have another sound that's actually coming out of your horn that's out here. So, for me, I found that playing quiet, real soft, to really listen to the notes, you know, pay attention to, okay, where's my intonation at? Is my note wavering like this? So if I'm playing a note, bah, it's going bah, or is it getting a real straight tone? Those are the things I practice on a lot. And then, I mean, the other, as far as patterns and things like that, you know, to get your dexterity, that's what I did. Uh, learning my scales. You know, the basic things that you would do, whether you're playing jazz or classical or whatever, it's all technique. You know, 
then outside of that is studying music. I mean, you see me, you know, when I was coming up, you see me a lot of times without my horn, listening to music, writing things down, learning, learning how to transcribe inside my head, visualizing the piano in my head, practicing those things. You know, so when I be prepared, so I can sit up here and just play right now without a rhythm section behind me and hear all the chord changes go by and put you know, put them in my solo so you can hear them. You know, practicing those things. For me, there was three parts to my practice day. I had what I call, I still do, <clears throat> I have what's called a maintenance routine, which is long tones, flow studies, um, scales, arpeggios, all of the things that it takes to make sure that you can play an instrument correctly <laughs> or, in, or in my maintenance routine. Um, then I have, my second routine is some type of classical repertoire, whether it be etudes, whether it be uh, solos or excerpts, orchestral excerpts, those kinds of things. A lot of people disagree with me on this and they say, well, you don't need that, why don't you just play jazz for that? The reason that I, I uh, dive into the classical repertoire is because in the classical genre, there is a few hundred years of them studying the pedagogical component of the instrument a certain way and they have been successful over a long period of time doing that. Even your great jazz musicians have studied their concepts of playing. Uh, there's, a there's a difference between practicing music and practicing the horn, if that makes any sense. Okay, so what I want to do is take my maintenance routine and build off of that, build things and try to fit them in a certain kind of way to phrase music and combine them with certain melodies that are in the European classical tradition to um, reinforce what I did in my maintenance routine. Then, third session is jazz. So I've already taken the maintenance, the reinforcement of that maintenance, and now it's really ingrained in me, so I'm doing it sort of naturally now, and I can focus on this music that we call jazz and improvisation and all of that. And reinforce that even more. Um, but also, what I would do, a lot of people don't do, is I had a practice log. Before I practice, I would take 15 minutes and do nothing. Turn off the TV, turn off the cell phone, make sure that it's quiet to prepare my mind for what I'm about to do. And also, when I was done practicing, I would assess what I did. Did I accomplish this? All of that, I would write it all down in a log, and I would have goals, daily goals, weekly goals, monthly, uh, quarterly, every three month goals, yearly, and then I would, in the back of the practice log, I would have what I wanted to do in like 10 years time, or what I wanted to do in five years time, both tangible and in intangible goals. So I was very intense with, there's nobody else around me was <laughs> out from Warren, Ohio, Everybody else was kind of like trying to go to, you know, the diner and talk to girls or whatever. So I completely countered that. It was very intense about practicing and being a musician. Is the trumpet player to do that? to make it as vocal as possible. Um, I listen to a lot of vocalists and um, if it's a if it's a ballad that's an American popular song, I learn all the words, try to get <clears throat> a few different examples of that being sung and, and played uh, instrumentally. And then I figure out what that tune means to me. I darn that dream. I mean typically I won't play a tune unless it really means something, especially a ballad. Okay, because I'm constantly in communication mode. When I'm playing music, I'm not playing it because I want to be up on stage playing notes and something for me, because I like to do it. I realize that I'm a servant to humanity and I have to play a story, okay? That's really important to me. It's like, why are you playing? Are you playing for yourself? If so, you can do that at home. Spare everybody else, please. 
So when I'm up here, I am a servant. I am supposed to portray an emotion and a feeling to you. And without, I can't really portray anything to you or give you a feeling of something if I don't feel it first. Okay, so in the ballad, I really get next to what that tune is. I uh, have it relate to some part of my life. What do these words mean? Do I know somebody with this story? And then I play that story. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, to add on to that, that was a very good description, Sean. That was it. That was it. Uh, to add on to that, um, you know, when you're talking about a subject, you use different things in your language. Uh, if you're excited about something, you usually bring up in volume, right? You know, if you're really intimate about something, if you, you know, uh, introspective about something, you bring your volume down. I utilize those same techniques. I'm acting like I'm singing a song. And I use those same techniques that I would use with my voice, like I said, vocalizing. You always talk up, down, up, down. So that should be in your play. Always. Not just balance, but always. You know, the balance, you do it, you pay more attention to it because you're so exposed at that point. I mean, really, in the ballad, you're very vulnerable. Everybody can hear what your sound is really like. You know, uh, what you really know as far as harmony. Uh, you know, how you push your melodic ideas. Are you really saying something or are you just playing patterns? All of that is exposed during the ballad. So, I me, mean, I try to use everything in my knowledge, everything that I know, and try to put that to explain the ideas and the, and the way I feel at that time into that ballad. I may be a little upset. You should be able to feel that, how I feel that day. I may be thinking about my family. You should be able to feel that. I may be mad about the economy. You should be able to feel that. You know? But I use all the tools that I learned like, like, like you learn, you know, like he talks about in your maintenance session of your practicing. All those things you practice on, your technique, um, your air control, dynamics, all those things that you work on, you should maybe use all of that to portray your ideas. Don't be afraid to feel. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be a human being. Okay? And, and it seems like it's getting increasingly difficult, more difficult, to really be a human being. With, with technology and everything that's going on, everything's like... But just stop for a second and feel, feel love, feel pain, embrace those feelings. Because it's our job to communicate that, okay, through music. And um, if you feel something during the day, maybe stop and just go pick up your horn or whatever it is and try to play what it is that you're feeling or write a tune about it. Um, I think that most of my development really came when I started to write tunes about different things in my life as I got in touch with who I am. And the greatest ballad players in, on, the, on the planet, they were themselves. <laughs> and they let everybody know it and they weren't afraid to show it either. So, you notice how you feel better when you get something off your chest? When you talk to somebody about something that's really bothering you or something that you really feel or, or something good that you saw that day and you just really want to tell somebody. That's the advantage of being a musician. We're able to do that. At any given moment, we're standing on the stage or we're practicing or what our home, we're able to really just convey how we feel about something, something we saw. Uh, sometimes I'm playing in front of the television I know it's kind of crazy, but I, sometimes I play with the television, sometimes with the television and radio, with the window open outside, and the cars going by, and all these different things stimulating my senses while I'm playing the horn and trying to interact with all of that. I said, oh man, look, what was happening on the news? All oh, these people did this and that and the other, or, or check this out, they got a news, they got a program about birds, you know, and you start playing all for that. And thank you very much for the sound effects. <laughs> But that's the advantage of being a musician. You're able to do all of that with your horn. And you just feel good. You notice that people who don't feel that good during the day, 
when they get finally get a chance to play. Like we used to talk about Lionel Hampton. Lionel Hampton's 80 something years old. He's barely able to walk on the stage, walk through the cane. He's like this the whole time. Uh, this is hard. This is hard. He get on the stage and play for three hours straight. Everybody in the 20s. I remember I was in the band. I was in. I was in my early 20s. I was tired, and he wanted to play some more. That's what music can do for you. I had to pick one, it would be Miles Davis. Just because Miles embodied so much. <laughs> but look at the records. I mean, just check his records out. The periods, the, the periods, his transitions in them, his, the way he led his band, his sound. I mean, he was a complete and total musician. He could play his horn. He had a beautiful sound that was his own. He could swing, he could transcend genre. He, I mean, I don't really know if there was truly anybody else that was really like that in jazz. Dizzy. Dizzy, Diz. Diz. I mean, but Miles was, I mean, if you, <laughs> Miles, I mean, he, one of his last records was a record with a rap. I mean, it's like, come on. This is the same cat that recorded with Bird playing tenor. Just think about that alone. The fact that he had the foresight to say, I'm going to use Charlie Parker on my record, but he's not going to play alto. He's going to play tenor. And that, that's, that's some thinking right there. So I, and I think all of his albums are like that. He's really thinking outside the box. He's trying to push the album. I can't say it because this is so many musicians I just love so dearly. You know, Cannibal Adderley, Sonny Stitt, Dizzy Gillespie, Kenny Durham, the same people I hear every time I turn on my, my iPod. That's what I listen to. Oh, God. I was listening to Dan Guest uh, yesterday. Uh, he did a record. I am listen to a lot of things with orchestras. That's just in my head right now. And uh, he did a terrific record called Focus. And uh, oh, man. and there's another one, uh, the Tanglewood Concerto, that he, that uh, that's another record. I think it's called Sundown in Tanglewood. Uh, another great record. Yes, that case, that case was something else. sent me a text message with, with his, uh, he just had a, well, his wife had a baby, I'm not gonna say he had a baby. <laughs> he sent me a picture of my little nephew, and he was all happy, he called me up, and check this out, and I, I was moved, and while I was looking at the picture, a melody just came, and I wrote it out on a napkin, and later on I went to the piano and finished writing it, so, I think you just gotta be ready, and you gotta be open all the time. And what, whatever comes, be ready to get it. And, you know, musicians are emotional, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we really are. So we try not to be, try to be hard. And, Yo, what's up? <laughs> no, none of us really are like that. I mean, to, to, to do what we do, you know, there's a lot of passion and a lot of openness to a lot of things. And I think you got to be ready when that time comes, whenever a tune comes. If you if you got your own in hand, cool. If you don't, be ready. I've lost a lot of tunes by not writing them down like oh, that. Yeah. I think it's hard. It's hard to think about. Oh, that's okay. a good question. Yeah, thank you for asking it. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's two, three, uh, two. There's probably more trains of thought on that, but uh, the two I think of is, you know, know when to lay out. That's very important. I mean, piano players, you know, even when, when there's no guitar player and the 
man. Sometimes we, we forget, you know, how to stroll, that we call it. Sometimes you have to know when to stroll, when to let one person take over the combat. And it, it could be a great effect, too. Say if, say if you have one solo where you get the saxophone is taking a solo and you want the piano behind it, the piano's playing, you know, you kind of lay loose. And then the trumpet come in and do his solo, then the piano lays loose and the guitar plays. Playing together, I mean, that's, that's, that's really a difficult thing. Since I don't play guitar, and I don't play, I, I really can't, can you, can you address it? Uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways I think about this. One, you gotta understand what's involved in copying. In copying, you have rhythm, you have melodic lines that you can comp with, you have chords that you can comp with, um, certain riffs you can comp with silence, single notes. So um, when there's a pianist and a guitarist, sometimes you have to know your role. Like if you're going to play simultaneously and the pianist is playing a lot of thick chords or whatever, then if I'm a guitarist, then I'm going to think melodic line and repetition, almost like a lead guitarist. Okay? Now if the piano player is playing rhythmic pulses, then maybe I play like patch chords that are really open that could fit inside of that. Um, the piano player is playing a lot of rhythm. Uh, if I'm playing a lot of rhythm, then the pianist might just decide to play patches. Or you can have that layout type of a feel. I mean, it's about architecture, okay? Layers too. Yeah, layers and architecture and what fits in where. Um, this is one of the reasons why I love listening to James Brown, man. The JBs. Because there was so many layers in that, and they all fit together perfectly. I mean, you had a Bootsy doing one thing. You, I mean, it was like, and they, when they found where it fit, they just stayed there forever. <laughs> and that's why it felt so good. And jazz, of course, you got push and pull and give and take, and you just got to be willing to communicate and dialogue with whoever is there and understand the dynamics of copying, okay? Like, check out how people in the past come. Whitney Kelly's approach, Red Garland's approach, McCoy's approach, uh, the, the list goes on and on and on and have a lot of material in your back to counter material that's being given to you. You could probably try also just to think about if, if a piano player is playing in a certain range, may not try to be in the same range that they're in. Right. Come higher in your guitar. And when they're playing an upper register, you come back, you know, that kind of thing to kind of help Larry. But this is really a, there's a lot of records out there, you know, a lot of Grant Green records where he's playing, he has piano and he's playing guitar. And just study those records, you know, do a little study. But I, I'm going to look at it also. That's an interesting question. The most impact one? On my style? Kenny Dora. I would say for me it's a combination of Clifford Brown and Woody Shaw together. Um, I love Woody Shaw. Yeah. I mean, it's like, for some reason I gravitate towards that and I hear that way. It may be strange, but I just hear what he does naturally. Yeah. She just had her hand raised yeah, for a while. She but has. Okay, what exercises I do to play in the higher register of the trumpet? All the time? Okay, well that's something that I don't want to do all the time. It's <laughs> playing the higher register of the trumpet. But I don't look at the trumpet in terms of playing high and low. Pianists don't look at it that way. Okay. Um, I try to think of it all being one register. And what I do is I expand all of my exercises to incorporate the upper register, the extreme registers, the uh, upper register and the lower register, as if they are just tools to get to an effect and not playing high. Because if you have, if you focus on playing high trumpet, then you, what's going to happen is you're going to have a concept for playing high, and that concept for playing high may be different than your concept for playing low. And then what happens when you have to bridge the two together? You're gonna to switch concepts? No, so yeah, I just have one concept for playing, okay? 
one general concept for producing sound and for, for playing in the upper registers, and I try to bridge that and build, build on it. Um, now to create pressure, I use, I was talking about the oral cavity the, uh, earlier, because it does take pressure to play high. But understand something, that um, air pressure does not create air flow. Air flow can balance itself and create air pressure. Okay, so if your air is flowing constantly at a rate of speed, then you can take your tone and alter the pressure a little bit and that will make the pitch go higher. Okay? So I think of it like whistling. Okay, so my oral cavity changes slightly. Does that make sense? There is no audition process to play a jazz and a center. You're chosen. <laughs> you get a phone call out of the yeah, room. Like you won the lottery or something. <laughs> Without the money. Without the money. <laughs> Song, you hear a song a thousand different ways. Carmen Cray may sing it one way, 
Ella Fitzgerald may sing it another way, Sarah Vaughn may sing it another way. It'd be in the same tempo, the same key, but they approach it a different way just based on how they hand it. So how you do it, you just try it. Just do it. Thank you.